So much going on for every college football program. So once the games end, then the real action begins off the field. We got David Waters here from Gators Breakdown, breaking down Florida football like nobody else. If you're not aware, it's Gators Breakdown on your favorite audio platform and also right here on YouTube. David, what's going on? Mark, uh, the, the the way you had that intro there, and, and for Gators Breakdown, the, the moniker goes, there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. And, uh, man, uh, yeah, you can say that for almost every college football program right now, though. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to guess that uh, the response to Graham Mertz coming back is more favorable, I hope, than it would have been if he would have told Gator fans this like last August. Yeah, you're going to have Graham Mertz for two years. It, it is funny, Mark, because I, I told myself probably in August or some point where, hey, if 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 Graham Mertz is because we knew he had two years of eligibility left when he transferred from Wisconsin. And I did, you know, if I, I think I even asked a question to get his breakdown plus members or even Twitter or something. I was like, hey, if Graham Mertz comes back for a second year, what does what does that mean? Um, and. My own mind is I think that would probably mean pretty good. It would be pretty good. Like not good enough to go to the NFL, but good enough to where you would, if he's coming back, where you probably would want him back. Uh, and that's, I think that's exactly what we're getting here. Um, now I did hear behind the scenes, there was probably a little more favorable love from the NFL than what we would, would think, but not at the level to get him to jump just yet. So um and I think it's big for Billy Napier, Mark. First, first of all, you know, coming off of a six and seven season, coming off of a five and seven season. Now, uh, year three is big, and I know DJ Lagways is five star quarterback and one of the top quarterbacks in the country. But if you're in maybe a hot seat or do or die year, or at least very critical year for Billy Napier, do you really want to be turning the keys to an offense over to a true freshman or taking a chance on another transfer portal quarterback? So. He knows what he has in Graham Mertz. I think there is probably another level to Graham Mertz, and I don't know how, how how much there is, but I do think there's another level to that. And look, if Florida magically, I will say magically at this point, Mark, gets a better defense, then, hey, Graham Mertz is just fine for what we saw this year uh, and, and, and carrying this Gator offense. So, you know, lose Ricky Pearsall as well, uh, or him going to the draft. So lose that number one weapon, but we did see Trey Eugene Wilson really go through the season as well. So he already has a rapport with it, with a receiver at the same time. There's some young receivers that Florida will try and develop. I think they'll hit the portal there as well uh, to try and get another weapon to replace Pierce Hall. But all in all, Mark, I do think is kind of going to your point. Uh, before Graham Mertz started his game at Florida, I don't think many people were excited. But as the season went on, I think at least uh, the quarterback Florida can depend on for the 2024 season. I think he led the SEC in completion percentage. Yeah. yep. So looking at this unprecedented list of transfer quarterbacks, Dante Moore at UCLA is kind of a different deal because he just got a little time at UCLA. He's a five-star. He only played a little bit. So he's a down-the-road kind of guy that somebody's looking to bring in to be their future. The rest of these guys have played a lot of football. So because of who Graham Mertz is and because of having the stud freshman, do you think that they don't, rock the boat and bring somebody else in for competition's sake? I wrestle with that one, Mark. Competition is never a bad thing. But no, I don't. I think you would be hard-pressed to find somebody who would want to put themselves in that situation. Uh, Graham Mertz is the guy who's coming back. A lot of experience. DJ Lagway is a five-star quarterback coming in. I wouldn't want – I mean, I, granted, don't get me wrong. I don't necessarily want people to shy away from competition, but at the same time – Common sense has got to come into play here, too. And if I'm looking for snaps, Florida is probably not a very, very favorable spot to go get snaps just because of that situation. Now, it opened up a bit. Max Brown, who started the Florida State game, who came in the Missouri game, he announced that he's going to transfer away. So there is a, a, a spot open. But I think if you're a quarterback looking for a lot of snaps, Florida is probably not the place you want to go. Now, looking at the other positions on both sides of the ball, where do you think the priorities lie in the transfer portal? Um, I, I mentioned wide receiver more. I think they do have to find a, 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 a receiver who can test down the field a bit more. Uh, Wilson, who did come along was still a lot of throws, like maybe his deeper throws would be 15, 20 yards down the field and, and maybe some catch and run opportunities. But a lot of them were some, you know, some, some pop passes, some, 
screens, a lot of passes short to the line of scrimmage and see if he can make something happen after the catch. Uh, I think Florida needs, an, if they can, find an established down-the-field threat at receiver, somebody who can stay on the outside, somebody who can run a nine route, and you know you can throw it up, and he's got a good chance of coming down with it. I think if they can get somebody like that, uh, that is one spot absolutely they need to go. And then, Mark, you know, while we're on the news to, to, today, Princely Human Mielin, uh, we wonder he was the Gators' leading tackle for loss guy this past year, leading sack guy for Florida this year. I think he needs some help, more help up front. He would have been better, but he announced he's going to enter the transfer portal. And there was some some thought: would he go to the NFL? That would be his next step. No, his next step is the transfer portal. Uh, and so, does he go back home to Texas? He was at the SEC championship game uh, this past week. Is Georgia or Alabama on his radar? So, um, but now for I think. You know, now with him gone, Florida needs an edge rusher, a pure edge rusher. And they've had some young guys like TJ Searcy and Kelby Collins really play as true freshmen this year. But I think you need somebody with experience. If you can, as I say, proven. But I think it's probably one of the bigger things for me in this transfer portal is every year now, you're getting guys that are proven in the transfer portal. You know, it's not just guys that are not getting playing time. It's not guys that are unhappy with the situation. It's guys who are starter for a team. It's guys who have led their team in statistical categories hit the transfer portal. So, look, there are going to be options out there for Florida. And uh, you know, When I say go get a proven guy, you just couldn't say that about the transfer portal a whole lot. Now you can say that. There are a lot of proven commodities in the transfer portal. Uh, so at wide receiver for Florida, at edge rusher for Florida, so you don't have to rely on some young guys. I, I think we like what we saw from the young guys, but I do think if you can get an established guy, you go that route and, you know, create some more competition for your team. So, Mark, those, those are the two spots I'm probably looking at in offensive line for Florida. It's been – it was so bad this year not being able to take a step in Billy Napier's second season. They dealt with a ton of injuries. So, at least – at the very least, Mark, dependable depth along the offensive line, preferably instant impact, guys that they can kind of plug and play there. I don't know how many of those are in the transfer portal. Offensive line, I think, is the hardest one to kind of gauge. Uh, but for Florida, at the very least for offensive line, some dependable depth that they can really, really insert and create some competition in that group. David Waters, Gators Breakdown. We always uh, rely on David to stop by and give us some Florida uh, knowledge here, but uh, to do it each and every day on a consistent basis, you got to get on over to Gators Breakdown right here on YouTube or on your favorite audio platform. Last time we talked, David, I hit you up on the recruiting class because out of all the schools that are in that top five to 10 to 15 even range, you're looking at everyone's been playing good football. They've been cranking out the W's. Florida's kind of sitting there by themselves as a team that, okay, is another off season really going to hurt this class? Uh, where does it stand right now? Three weeks away. Do you think uh, Billy Napier is going to be able to hold it together? A class that uh, still stands at number six. Mark, I think so. The name is if 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 you want to go where it maybe could get worse for Florida, the name to watch out for. And look, I know you've heard the name and your Ohio State background. Maris Williams is a defensive lineman, um, and he's been to Ohio State's campus. He's visited. I know he's been almost since he started visiting Ohio State a bit. It's kind of just been on flip watch, uh, and it hasn't happened yet. Surprisingly, I think we still mostly think it will, but at the same at the same time, some people have thought it would have happened by now. Uh, so it's Florida doing the net. Florida's been by the scene this week as well. Uh, as since you know you can start making in home visits now. So of course one of the best defensive linemen in the country. Florida's going to do everything in their power uh, to, to to go keep him. So but at the same time, Mark, we're a week and a half now. We're Florida fired defensive line coach Sean Spencer. Um, so Florida's right now is without a defensive line coach uh, while they're hitting the, the the recruiting trail. Um, now also you got Mike Peterson who goes into you know that edge role where Amaris Williams will probably be playing a lot. He kind of coaches that group up as well. You know, but we start looking at where can Florida be affected in recruiting right now. It really is a storyline of deep. It really is a storyline of defensive line. As I just mentioned, Sean Spencer out. He's at Texas A&M now. Florida's still looking for a defensive line coach. I just mentioned Amaris Williams, but this past weekend, Florida got a, a recommit from Makai Burrow, who decommitted in September. Looked like he was going to flip to Georgia, never flipped to Georgia, recommitted to Florida, and then had a decommit from um, uh, Kendall Jackson from a local Gainesville guy. Uh, there was some this miscommunication of whether he played inside or outside. Um, it wasn't really communicated with him about the coaching change. Looks like Miami might, might be his next stop. So, 
as we look at the big recruiting storylines right now, it's really up front the trenches for Florida on the defensive side of maybe how this thing's going to shake out. But Mark, right now, Amaris Williams is really kind of the only name in Xavier Fields to me, the five-star safety out of Texas. It does look like he's going to take an official to Texas. That, w- that one would hurt. That one would really hurt. It's a position of need for Florida. It's a guy who's been committed for a while from Florida. Um, and you've kind of been able to hold everything at bay so far. Would he take that visit to Texas or would he not take that visit to Texas? Well, it's come out this week. He's going to take that visit to Texas. And look, they're kind of on a roll in recruiting right now. They're in the college football playoff. They can sell that as well. Uh, so Florida's really got to hang on for dear life, Mark. And I think in these next couple, two, two three weeks, because of the top of their board. That's where, if they're going to lose Williams, they're going to lose Phil Simi, where you got this class ranked in the top 10 right now, that's what would really hurt because it's at the top of your board and on the defensive side of the ball where we know Florida needs the most help. Let's stay right there with the defense uh, looking toward 24. Is this a situation where, and I'm not going to sell this as a situation where this is you know, the next uh, Georgia 2021 defense or anything like that, but do you think there's a framework of talent that can be worked with to upgrade the defense significantly. Like, is this more development of players scheme change that, or do they need a significant talent upgrade on this defense to be, you know, an upper tier sec defense. Mark four years now, since 2020, this, you know, this defense has not been anywhere near for Florida. You could always count on a good defense. Last four years, you cannot say that whatsoever. Um, at this point, Mark, where I think they're at, this past year, down for down, they weren't that bad. They took strides in down to down defense, but what killed them and what killed them a lot, what what erased every bit of that, giving up explosives. They could not stop an explosive play. They gave up more 50 yard or 50 yard, 60, 70, 80 yard plays than other any other defense out there, Mark. They just for whatever reason, just gave up the big play. Problem there is, that was Austin Armstrong's calling card coming from Southern Miss as a defensive coordinator. He gives up explosives. Well, we saw it in year one at Florida, and it really, really hurt this defense. Uh, look, third down defense, which has been terrible under Florida. I think that was, if I remember right from the stats I pulled this week, was like in the 40th range. You would take that from what we've seen the last few years of third down defense for Florida. Big improvement there. But overall, their defense got hurt because they could not stop the explosive. So, first of all, you got to see if Austin Armstrong can get rid of that reputation. That that's you know it starts with him. It's just kind of been his mo. But you do have experience now. That's kind of been the question: if it is it talent, is it development, is it coaching? Well, part of the talent is you did play a lot of young talent. Now, what we got to do is see that pay off. We got to see that pay off in you. I, I mentioned the guys up front: T.J. Searcy, Kelby Collins. Those are two true freshmen getting a lot of snaps toward the end of the year. Yeah, you hope that pays off. Started playing some younger linebackers. Started playing. You had two true freshman safeties playing a lot of the snaps toward the end of the year. So, Mark, I think right now I'll lean. It's more experience that hurt this Florida defense. But at the same time, given the MO of Austin Armstrong, you got to see that experience pay off. And something that you know needs to save him is that that those explosives that Florida gives up. So right now, I'm I'm willing to give it. Oh, yeah, they, they just need to get the experience in. Um, you change defensive coordinators in year one to year two. You got a defensive coordinator coming back, but you've made some other changes uh, with Corey Raymond gone, Sean Spencer gone. So we'll see what hires they make as well. Uh, but a lot of it, you know, I think you just got to see all that play and time you gave youth this year. You got to see it pay off. It looked like a good defense the last night of the year against Florida State, but that was probably more Tate Rodemaker yeah, than Florida yeah. State uh, yeah. until they got worn down in the fourth quarter and got beat up a little bit there. Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I agree with you on the most part, uh, uh, Mark, but because uh, <laughs> it, it go back to that Arkansas game where there were, I mean, Arkansas looked like garbage before that game. They looked like garbage after that game and just torched Florida's defense. So. I do think they probably played one of their best games versus Florida State. I do think it had something to do with them because Florida State's offensive line is pretty good. Uh, and in the first half of that game, Florida's defensive line ran over Florida, Florida State's offensive line. But halftime adjustments were made, Florida State uh, adjusted. But you know, I would say if Florida could have combined you know, the first half of the Tennessee game and the first half of the Florida State game on defense and duplicated that about six more times throughout the year, it would have been just fine as a defense. But, yeah, Mark, it is uh, – 
you know, it was just not enough consistency on that side of the ball. And, and I think Gator Nation is hoping that consistency comes from getting those guys more experience. So since we're on that, I'll hit you with this uh, to close uh, because it's the talk of college football, of course. So Florida jumps out 12 zip. Uh, Florida State comes back and wins. That ruins Florida getting to a bowl game, getting the 15 extra practices. Don't like losing to a rival, of course. On the flip side, it's a poor performance by the Florida State offense. Tate Rodemaker's one shot to impress the committee. And of course, we know what's happened here uh, with that uh, decision. Uh, does, does Florida, do Florida fans care? Are they laughing at Florida State? Do they think that they had some kind of hand in it? Anything? Uh, hey, I did an episode on that last week. You know, oh. I, I kind of got uh, kind of got slammed for it by <laughs> Florida State fans, but I, I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that Florida did have some effect on it. Now, for Florida fans, one effect was you just weren't very good, so you hurt Florida State. Florida State strength of schedule. If Florida had been a nine and nine and two team rolling into that game, Florida State wins even this, even in the same fashion. All right, well their strength of schedules boosted a little bit more. Maybe the committee overlooks it. Also, I don't think it was intentional, but Jaden Hill knocks out Tate Rodemaker. He was not able to play versus Louisville. Say he plays versus Louisville, and they win that game 31-10 with him as a starting quarterback. Do they, does the committee then put Florida State in there? You know, Florida in some way affected, all right, you didn't have your better quarterback out of the two quarterbacks you had available. And... There you go. So I do think in some ways, you know, Florida could have uh, affected Florida State, you know, toward the end of Florida State season right there. And uh, a better Florida team gives a better strength of schedule. If they don't knock, knock out their quarterback, he puts a good performance. I can see him still making the college football playoff. I thought I'd get something out of you there. Very good. <laughs> hey, got, got to come yeah. up with a gator angle somehow. Um, <laughs> but and, that, and that's not me trying to give Florida credit for anything. You know, like I said, you know, Florida would have loved to be a nine and three team and makes make, sense. Yeah. So, you know, and it just, and the unfortunate situation of, of taking Rod to make her out, you know. So, David Waters, Gators Breakdown. It is the place to be for Florida football talk. If you love the SEC, hey, make it one of your destinations. College football nerds that want to keep track of everything, there you go. Gators Breakdown. It's right here on YouTube. And again, your favorite audio platform as well. David, always appreciate the time. Appreciate you stopping by. Thanks, Mark.